Well, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you all for joining us. It's wonderful to have this opportunity to welcome all of you to this event in our Faith and Culture series, focused today on Pope Francis's most recent encyclical, Fratelli Tutti, on fraternity and social friendship, and commitments he describes for us to one another and to the common good. We began to reflect on the significance of this encyclical in the days after it was released at a convening held by our initiative on Catholic social thought and public life in October. In our gathering this afternoon, we continue this conversation joined by three distinguished writers, thinkers, Michael Sandel, Marilyn Robinson, and Pankaj Mishra. Each provides us with ways of thinking about solidarity and community. Paul Eli, senior fellow at our Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs, has provided terrific leadership of our faith and culture series over the past 13 years. He'll moderate our conversation. These are three writers he knows well from his time in publishing at Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux, and from his teaching here at Georgetown. I'm grateful to our Berkeley Center and our initiative on Catholic social thought and public life here at Georgetown for their support of this convening and to our partners, the Pontifical Council for Culture and La Civita Cattolica for their shared vision of this work. I'd especially like to recognize Bishop Paul Tai, Secretary of the Pontifical Council for Culture for his leadership and for his presence today and to the editor-in-chief of La Civita Cattolica, Father Antonio Spadaro, for his many contributions to Georgetown. Next week, Father Spadaro will be joining a panel hosted by our Berkeley Center on Pope Francis's recent visit to Iraq to share his reflections as a participant in this historic papal visit. We're invited in this moment to reflect on the idea of social solidarity its expression within the Catholic tradition and its resonances across our global community. Fratelli Tutti is an extraordinary resource to each of us, and especially as we face the challenges of COVID-19. It guides us in embracing the inherent dignity of each person, serving the most vulnerable among us, and recommitting ourselves to the common good calling for greater unity and solidarity in responding to the political, social, environmental, and economic challenges of our moment, Pope Francis writes, and I quote, once more we realized that no one is saved alone. We can only be saved together, close quote. And we're privileged to welcome each of our guests back to Georgetown and to have them here together bringing their perspectives and insights into a conversation on the idea of social solidarity. First, joining us on a late evening in India is Pankaj Mishra, a prolific writer of essays and long form journalism, fiction and nonfiction books, most recently, Bland Fanatics, Liberals, Race and Empire. And he's made important contributions to our understanding of liberalism, the human condition, and the tensions that have come to define structures of power within modern civilization. And it's my pleasure to welcome Marilyn Robinson, a Pulitzer Prize winning author, whose writing invites us into a dialogue on faith and ethics, science and public life. In her latest essay collection, What Are We Doing Here? She once again provides beautiful meditations on the spirit of American civic, cultural and intellectual life, exploring ideas of humanism faith, and human fallibility. And finally, I'd like to welcome Michael Sandel, the Ann T. and Robert M. Bass Professor of Government at Harvard University, a celebrated author and scholar. His writings bring, bring us to wrestle with the assumptions, ideas, and values foundational to the workings of our society. For 40 years, he's translated these ideas into one of the most popular courses at Harvard, focused on justice. His most recent book, The Tyranny of Merit, what become, What's Become of the Common Good, explores important questions about inequality and mobility and the moral foundations of merit within our society. We're excited to have these three extraordinary individuals with us and to have Paul guide us in conversation 
I wish to express my deep gratitude to all of you for joining us today. I'm gonna to turn it over now to Paul. Thank you very much, President DeJoya. Thanks to the participants. Thanks uh, to our sponsoring partners. Thanks to all of you uh, who've joined as audience. And also, I feel personal, you know, I, I'm um, moved to thank uh, my longtime colleagues at Farrah, Strauss and Giroux. The event is framed as an event having to do with social solidarity, but the language that Francis uses is the language of uh, social friendship and fraternity. It's the language of family. And my feeling for the three writers gathered here today is something like a family feeling because I worked for their publisher for many years and got to interact with them. And that um, family feeling then informed my reading of their work and of this encyclical together. So thanks to Jonathan Galassi, to Eric Chinsky, and now to Mitzi Angel for all you've done at Farrah Strauss and Giroux uh, for these authors and their books. The event came together in my mind pretty simply. In October, when Fratelli Tutti was released, I had uh, just been reading uh, works of recently published by all three of the authors who are here today. Uh, one um, by Marilyn Robinson in the New York Review of Books, one by Michael Sandel in the New York Times, and, uh, a couple by Pankaj Mishra in the London Review of Books. And it was just very striking, the points in common between these thinkers and their work and the work that was before me, Fratelli Tutti. Some time passed. We have an informal tradition, not just at Georgetown, but in the Catholic intellectual world, I'd say, of marking the election of Pope Francis in March by through an event of some kind. So I thought we would do something in March. In this time, March has an extra um, significance. March in Italy was the gravest moment of the pandemic. And at a particularly grave moment on a Friday evening in the rain, Pope Francis went out alone into St. Peter's Square and spoke to the moment of the pandemic as a predicament that we uh, globally have in common. And with that language in mind, he then um, continued to write the encyclical and some of that language found its way into the document. So uh, we're coming up on a year after that and these themes are particularly pertinent in the pandemic. And then going back uh, to when we were all um, habitually meeting at Georgetown, a couple of years back, uh, Pankaj and I had a conversation in Copley Hall on the campus in connection with his book, Age of Anger. And at one point in the conversation, Pankaj, you mentioned that Pope Francis, uncharacteristically among world leaders of his stature, um, has mounted a thoroughgoing critique of the established order. That really struck me because I uh, have thought of Francis more as uh, internally as a Catholic leader and what he's doing um, inside the church. And so your remark opened up a a very broad perspective on Francis's pontificate and his role uh, as a world leader. With that in mind, um, can you open the discussion just by uh, filling us in on what you meant? Thank you, Paul. Um, yes, you know, because it's often said um, about Pope Francis that he's uh, the first Jesuit Pope, he's first from the um, uh, Americas, first outside of Europe since the 8th century, uh, also first from the global south. Um, and for me, I think each of these firsts have a very specific meaning. Um, I mean, him being a Jesuit Pope, there are many of us in this country, in this part of the world, I'm actually one of them, we've grown up in Jesuit environments, schools and colleges who are products um, in, in many ways of the long Jesuit engagement with Asia. So those of us who were not born Christian have come to appreciate Christianity as a unique religion and worldview and something more as a sort of radical critique of society, um, which it has done by introducing the ideals of love and equality into a world that is by default defined by power and hierarchy. Uh, in many ways, my own notion of equality uh, has been enabled and enriched by uh, the Christian notion of equality before God. But the fact that the Pope is from the global South has an even greater, uh, a much more contemporary significance. Um, 
many of his specific concerns, which are stated in the encyclical about the excesses of the market, of the market economy, uh, the rise of inequality, the breakdown of all solidarities. Uh, they're all rooted in a very particular Latin American uh, experience. If he has spoken consistently against new liberalism in particular, he actually you know, started to do so well before the word um, entered general, uh, our general vocabulary. Um, he, he did so because he witnessed um, early on the, the depredations of new liberalism in uh, Argentina. And again, I mean, I think we tend to forget um, that many of the pathologies, the political pathologies that have been exposed in particularly in the United States and Britain in the last few years, they were first experienced and diagnosed in the countries of Asia, Africa, Latin America. Of course, uh, the way we looked at them in the past, the, 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 the modes of interpretation we brought to them, um, according to those, those pathologies were seen as products of defective cultures, histories, even religions. Um, I'm sure many people watching this program would remember how Islam was repeatedly blamed for angry, militant young men, uh, which in fact grossly unequal and despotic societies have produced right since the 19th century. Latin America was supposed to have a weakness for dictators uh, and, and, and so on. The reason I'm saying this is because I know from personal and often bitter experience how difficult it has been for writers and intellectuals from the global south to make their voices heard and their experiences and ideas count. What we are up against is this incredibly impoverished intellectual discourse emerging from not just the Western press, but other major Western institutions, universities, think tanks, um, a discourse that's impoverished both morally and intellectually about free markets, democracy, globalization, and it has drowned out all dissenting and critical voices. The intellectual itself, the figure of the intellectual has been, has been in, in, at least in the, in the conventional mainstream Western sense, has been reduced to someone who uh, is the missionary of material progress, who's, who's sort of, who, who, who is professionally the agent of this or that historical process, whether bringing free markets and prosperity to India or Indonesia or democracy to Russia or the Muslim world. This figure is not supposed to be concerned with larger questions about the nature of the good life, the limits to growth, the damage to the environment, the human relationship, the natural world. And, you know, God forbid, if he ever brings up spiritual or ethical values. So it's in the context of these extremely cramped intellectual horizons. Um, Pope Francis, I feel, has offered a new sense of possibility. He's expanded the parameters of what can be said, taught, and felt. I feel that not for a long time, uh, not since the days of the anti-colonial struggle in, in Asia and Africa, has there been such a powerful voice in the international arena, um, a voice that is pushing back against the secular narratives of continuous progress that have emerged from the ruling classes of, of the United States and, 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 and Britain. Um, there's, a, there's a very striking line in Marilyn Robinson's book on, uh, on Britain, mother country, uh, where she says that it's her effort to break down some of the structures of thinking that make reality invisible to us. These are monumental structures, large and central to our civilization. And I think uh, Pope Francis in many ways is, is engaged in that, in that task of breaking down those structures of thinking that have made reality invisible to uh, so many of us. Thank you, Pankaj. And of all that you said, um, one thing in particular stands out, the um, language of impoverishment or diminishment that uh, we are working for the last several decades, at least, with impoverished ideas 
of um, what what formerly I guess were um, broad and, and robust ideals, and that certainly is uh, a strong point of the essay that Marilyn Robinson had published and that I was reading when Fratelli Tutti came out. What kind of country do we want? Published in the New York Review of Books. Marilyn, you. Um, beautifully undertake what Pankaj just suggested, this um, breaking down of structures so that we can see better. And in the course of the essay, you set out how uh, our ideas of profit have been impoverished, our ideas of utility, our ideas uh, of austerity, our ideas of mutual benefit. And you suggest that in the moment of the pandemic, we have an opportunity to do some basic thinking about these things. And you were doing just that in the essay. Without wanting to force the point, am I right to see uh, um, some uh, aspects in common between uh, your thought and some of the things that Pope Francis set out in the encyclical? Oh, very much so. Um, you know, one of the things that I experienced reading the encyclical is how natural it seemed, how, of course, you know, we should take the best wisdom of our traditions and apply it to our circumstance, which would have to change in virtually every particular if we actually tried to do that. Um, the one thing that I, I really think we must keep in mind that was perhaps not so obvious to me when I was writing that is that we're going through a period of global transition, more complex more complete than we can possibly imagine at this point, you know, then we will, we will take centuries probably understanding what has happened because the whole world, I mean, technical things are transformed like communication. There hasn't been such a change since Babel fell, you know, and then uh, there is the disruption all, you know, all over the world, but it's the, the consequence in many cases of the fact that this of Procrustean uh, overlay, uh, this, the, this brutal economics that pretends that it will, if it's given its way, it will finally all work out, even though now we know that it's a great agent of disruptive change and of, of misery. Um, those things are true and they have to be taken into account as abrasions and conflicts that we have to anticipate. Um, in a, I'm just saying we, we should not be afraid. The people who are in the most imperiled situations, of course, will be afraid. And insofar as we're people of faith, uh, we have to realize that our role from the point of view of our relative good fortune and stability is to keep our heads and to try to make the best of any situation that we can make not to be ideological about it, to be pragmatic in the sense of making sure we alleviate injustice and, and misery where it occurs and so on. Make sure that we remember uh, that our obligations to other people can't be predicated on our fear of them, on, on the amount of change that they certainly imply by virtue of the historical changes that are occurring in the, in the world. Um, Sometimes I step back from things and think, this is very interesting, you know? Uh, and if it turns out to be true that in 20 years, the world is something that we would scarcely recognize at this point in terms of how populations are arrayed and where prosperity is more likely to be found and so on. That's just interesting at a certain level. That is speaking religiously, that's the will of God, you know? What we have to do is make sure that change is as little injurious as we can possibly make it. Um, and to, uh, to accept that what at best will be revealed is, is another fraternity, another brotherhood or sisterhood, something much more uh, enveloping uh, than anything that we've imagined to this point. Um, I remember when I believed that there was a momentum behind what was then the uh, prevailing economic model 
that would, was unstoppable, literally. It had taken on its own life and would continue in its own way. Um, and criticisms of it were very easily pushed aside as if it were a, a natural order that any attempt to impede or modify was simply, you know, naive, you know. Um, and I think it's amazing that at a certain moment, it stopped. At a certain moment, we could see very clearly that it was a, an arbitrary um, arrangement that we allowed to consider beyond our choices simply because it seemed so overwhelming. Although, of course, it was all made up of our choices, you know. Um, anyway, I, I, uh, I feel that it would be the most natural thing in the world to rediscover the essential unity of humankind and to relieve our consciences of the continuous awareness of our participation in deprivation, shunning, all the other things that make that arbitrarily make people's lives miserable, make them feel that they're being held as creatures of no value, you know? Um, the, you know, the idea that people are images of God, it seems to me ought to govern everything among people that are religiously serious. And therefore, that there is an element of blasphemy in, in undervaluing this image that he has given us as the invisible God. Um, basically, that's, that, that's my response. The notion of the image of God in all of us under, underpinning what we are to strive for is, is profound, and I'm going to just park that in my own mind because I don't know what to say in response just yet. But to hear you speak of change, and if this is a time of significant change, Marilyn, is very powerful because you have as deep a sense of history as any writer I know. And typically a person with your sense of history says, well, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, so for someone with your sense of history to say that the past several decades and the present we're in are really significant in terms of change and change of communications and technology, it really counts to hear it from you. You mentioned in your remarks change in our view of, of economics, what you've called at a certain point, the, a, a narrow notion of profit becoming an anthropology, a way of um, uh, reading human nature. And that's very close to what Michael Sandel has set out in, in his book, What Money Can't Buy, and now in the new book, The Tyranny of Merit. Michael, you, to me, very memorably um, spoke about uh, written about globalization and economic forces the last 30 years, achieving a, a form of social distancing, very different from the social distancing that we're talking about in everyday life right now, a distancing of whole populations from one another, of classes from one another, and of people who formerly belong to communities from one another. Uh, and that seemed to me uh, uh, very much in line with Pope Francis is saying in the encyclical um, is that the case or uh, am, I, am I getting this right? Yes, it is very much the case. And uh, I, I resonate to the themes in Fratelli Tutti and also to the comments just now by Pankaj, who uh, uh, in his writings and now has emphasized the toll of neoliberalism. And uh, Marilyn, who spoke strikingly about um, uh, not too long ago, um, many of us, most of us, assuming that the momentum, I think that was the term you used, Marilyn, the momentum of the kind of neoliberal globalization project was such that it was unstoppable. It was almost a fact of nature. Uh, you, you said just now, Marilyn, uh, part of the natural order. And now it doesn't seem to be the case as we face up to the toll that it's taken. And one, um, those, who, those who promoted and defended the neoliberal project of globalization presented it really as if we had no choice, as if it was a natural order, as if it was as unalterable about the weather, and therefore 
the only political question and the only moral question was whether we could adapt quickly. And the form of adaptation uh, that was recommended was to, uh, since the new economy would require skills and technocratic orientations and smarts, you'd better go to college. If you're worried about your job being outsourced to a low wage country, go to college, get a degree. What you earn will depend on what you learn. This was the mantra, the slogan. And this, this was closely connected to a kind of promise that seemed inspiring. You can make it if you try, if you get with the program, if you adapt in the ways we recommend. You can overcome the problem that you may notice around you of outsourcing and wage stagnation and widening inequality. But what happened was that during this three to four decade period, the divide between winners and losers deepened, poisoning our politics, driving us apart. And this was partly because of the inequality that came with this project. I think it was also about something else, changing attitudes towards success that came with it. Those who landed on top came to believe that their success was their own doing and that they therefore deserved the rewards the market heaped upon the successful. And by implication, that those who lost out, those who struggled, deserved their fate as well. So in this way, a set of attitudes toward success, toward winning and losing, made all the more toxic the economic inequalities that were deepening at the same time, which brings me to a certain uh, connection to Pope Francis, because he is very alive to the themes we here have been emphasizing about the market faith. And it's interesting that faith actually describes this view of markets. It was a kind of faith, not well articulated or defended morally, but it was a kind of faith that market mechanisms would be the primary instrument now for defining and achieving the common good. And together with this market faith is a certain belief that if markets are free and competitive, they will deliver to people what they deserve. And so what strikes me about Fratelli Tutti is that Pope Francis conceives, first he sees the way in which this project is an economic project, but also as a moral and political project is corrosive of the common good, undermines the possibility of solidarity. Because if we really believe that the winners deserve their winnings, it's very hard to think of ourselves as sharing a common fate and of having mutual responsibility for one another. It leads us to forget our, not only the role of luck, but also our indebtedness. And so what strikes me about Fratelli Tutti is that Pope Francis conceives that the case for solidarity depends on taking on not only markets and neoliberalism and the meritocratic ideas that lead the successful to inhale too deeply of their success. He understands that it requires taking on a certain image of freedom a conception of freedom that has its allure. And it's the idea of freedom that underlies the market faith and the belief that you can make it if you try. There is something powerful in that idea of freedom. And it's the idea that we are as human agents, as human beings, that we are or can be self-made and self-sufficient, you can make it if you try. 
And he takes this on very powerfully. He acknowledges the force of it. It's a consumerist idea of freedom. It's an individualist idea of freedom. And it, underlying it is the, the reach for a kind of self-mastery that Pope Francis um, invites us to reflect on. And he invites us to notice how this seemingly alluring idea of freedom as self-mastery and self-sufficiency cuts us off from community and meaning. And so the project of solidarity beyond being a political project is ultimately a spiritual project, a project that requires a spiritual turning from the being in the grip of this, this heady, even exhilarating notion of freedom, seeing it as spurious in the end. It's, it's the freedom that underlies the market faith and conceiving human freedom as, situ, as bound up with our situatedness and our indebtedness. Paul, do you, do you think that's a fair reading of Pope Francis? Pretty much so. And I, I think you use the language of freedom more than um, is found in the document, but that's uh, in the tension between uh, a robust conception of freedom and a debased conception of freedom very yeah. much animates uh, um, the conflict that, that, that he's setting out. All that the three of you have said, it's so rich. There's so many um, directions that this conversation could take. And I, and I hope that you will, you, all three of you will feel free to take it uh, where you want. But one specific area does come to mind. And I guess I would invite Pankaj and Marilyn to respond uh, to a specific aspect of the encyclical that Michael, you touched on. Um, and it has to do with the neoliberal economy that, that you set out. And it's the value and the devaluing of work. Marilyn, you observed somewhere that strangely in an American culture that supposedly prizes individual economic agency, we don't even have a word, uh, an American word for entrepreneur. <laughs> We're still stuck with the French word and that suggests there's something undeveloped in our idea of individuals as um, self-actualizing economic um, uh, free agents and that because the word hasn't formed, maybe it ought not to be formed because it's, it's not true to reality. Um, so you, you've spoken about the devaluing of, of, of work and Pankaj, you've spoken about or written about the, um, the devaluing of work and the, um, the felt need of people to um, fit into an economic model that um, is inapplicable and then the anger that uh, stems from that. Um, I'm glad, Michael, that you think the um, neoliberal faith ha has been broken, but before we move to uh, future prospects, can we reflect a little on just where work is now and what it means uh, uh, for the broken economy that we've got? Pankaj or Marilyn? Well, you know, I think that the devaluation of work is something that's happened quite literally in the fact that people are paid much less well for the same work than they were a generation ago. Um, I think that that has had the, it's as if the threat of poverty by American standards, poverty, um, is a coercive leverage to force people to work. And it seems to me as if that's based on an anthropology of, you know, a real disrespect for people. They like to work, they like to be productive. But if they are coerced, if they have no time to themselves because they're desperately trying to compensate for the fact of the fallen uh, evaluation of their work that has occurred across the economy, certainly with, with what we call the working class, um, then, uh, you know, of course they, feel, they don't feel as though they're contributing so much as though they're being driven, you know. Uh, they don't feel as if they can aspire so much as they feel as if they can, you know, escape disaster, you know. Um, these kinds of changes, I think, are inevitably uh, very powerful uh, politically and psychologically in all sorts of ways. We have gone through a period when people that are called essential have proven that they are essential. And they are also the people we routinely, seriously 
underpay. Um, the, we do it because we can, we do it because they're economically captive to the conventions around what they should be paid. Um, so I, you know, you can't ask people to, to be proud of something they do under conditions of despair and perhaps less well than they would do if they were not working two or three jobs. You know, I mean, I truly, I think we have to reconsider how we value, how we value the labor and the time, certainly the time of all people who work. One of the things I've noticed, um, and I think, I mean, one of the themes that speaks in uh, Michael Sandel's work very uh, powerfully to me is the theme of humiliation uh, and very closely related to the lack of opportunities, in, especially in the workplace, where you can find dignity and self-esteem for yourself. And this has now become uh, such an urgent political issue in India today, where um, in many ways we are still invested in this idea of a neoliberal, industrialized, consumer oriented economy as the way forward, as the way of the world. And a college degree, getting a college degree, leaving occupations that you already were pretty good at, but the, the pursuit of a college degree, because that will again get you into supposedly a better position or a better salary. These are all fantasies at, at, at one level, but those fantasies have been incredibly powerful. And so the dignity and the identity that you could have found in certain occupations, certain modes of work, you've lost that by in a way uprooting yourself from those occupations. And here you are chasing a college degree, a, a job in the metropolis that is, you know, in, 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 is, is for, for, for most people purely a fantasy. And I, and I see, and I see the faces of people who return from this experience of humiliation in the big cities. And essentially what they are, and, and you know, this village that I'm talking about is actually very idyllic. Um, it has a very different kind of culture altogether. It's a culture of solidarity, the community there is very strong. But in other parts of India, the same humiliated young men who return are uh, essentially fodder for all kinds of right wing ethnic racial supremacist movements. Um, so this is really, I mean, in that sense, I think the, uh, the repercussions, the political repercussions of this kind of everyday experience of humiliation, of feeling that you're losing out on something and that these other people have made it and that this is the kind of success that you need to achieve uh, in order to find a place, or in order to find a secure a, a dignity and identity for yourself. Um, this, is, this is really turned into, uh, this is what is driving, I would, I would venture to say, so much of what is, you know, in, in, in many ways gone wrong in, 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 the, in this country politically. So then I, what I gather has happened is what could be social solidarity has turned instead into, let's call it a fraternity of resentment and of anger uh, in its place. Michael? Well, picking up on Pankaj's point about uh, humiliation, it seems that politics today is riven by a toxic dialectic of hubris on the one hand and humiliation on the other. And this, I think, has to do with the emergence, the, 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 the way in which the inequalities that have deepened have uh, been combined with hubristic attitudes towards success by the well-credentialed, by the professional classes, um, and a sense of disempowerment and exclusion and humiliation by those who haven't flourished in the new economy and who feel looked down upon by professional credentialed elites. And I think that 
what we need to address this as a matter of moral and political philosophy is to broaden the project of justice. We normally, we commonly think of justice as distributive justice, figuring out how more fairly to distribute access to basic human goods, how to strengthen the sa and preserve the safety net, for example, a decent public provision of health and education and access to food and clothing and shelter. And all of this is important, but what it misses is that people care not only about distributive justice, but also about contributive justice, which connects with the dignity of work and with the, the erosion of the dignity of work. By contributive justice, I mean living in a society whose economy is configured in a way that enables everyone to contribute in some meaningful way to the common good, whether through the labor market or in some other way, in other venues, in families and communities. But the idea here is that the, the idea of contributive justice, and this is, I think, an idea that is well articulated in Catholic social teaching. And I find it very compelling. It's, it's the idea that the fundamental human need is the need to be needed by one's fellow citizens and to be able to deploy one's talents to answer those needs and to be recognized and appreciated for having done so. So contributive justice is not only about the dignity of work, it's also about the role of work, of contribution in winning recognition, honor, esteem, respect. And I think the source, the deepest source of the humiliation that Pankaj has spoken about is the sense among many working people that not only do elites look down on them, credentialed elites, but that the work they do isn't valued, isn't esteemed, isn't prized, is not a source of recognition. And so the challenge for an economy, it's also a, a moral challenge, is to create an economy and a moral and political way of understanding our life, our common life, that enables everyone to contribute and to be recognized for, for doing so. This, I think, is the heart of the dignity of work. So if the contributions of individuals were valued more, we would move away from radical individualism and towards something closer to um, social social friendship and vice versa if we had a stronger sense of the ties that bind us yeah. uh, we would value the work of others more than we do now um, the thing that is so striking about pope francis's approach and marilyn you use the word natural and i think that's a good one given all that he's seen and that we've seen there's just an assumption that on the one hand things somewhere were better once, and on the other, that they can be uh, different or better in the future. It, it's um, a very straightforward um, uh, sense that cha change um, is still possible. Uh, I guess the question, though, is um, if we're at a moment where we see that the um, neoliberal faith um, has collapsed, what is it that makes him or us think that um, change at this scale is possible? Uh, is it really uh, possible to move into the space that was created by the abdication of elites to their willingness to just let the market um, decide in so many instances? How can we move, move into that space? Is it possible to conceive on, of the common good on, on the global scale that the encyclical implies? I guess any of, any of you could speak to this question and you could just speak, speak to one another about it, but each, each of your work um, uh, deals with that question differently. Uh, Pankaj? I, I mean, I thought it was actually uh, fascinating that the encyclical in uh, thinking of or proposing a, 
proposing an antidote to all the problems um, it diagnoses, mentions, I think more than once, um, political movements, popular movements. Um, and I feel that uh, Pope Francis has in mind the kind of social movements that appeared in uh, Latin America starting the 80s and 90s, but something, something, something bigger than that. Um, so the kind of political movements that can create new solidarities, um, op offer opportunities for people to come together and act in concert. Um, in many ways, I mean, it reminds me, actually, it's not surprising at all that the encyclical uh, says towards the end that um, it, some of the ideas in it are indebted to um, people like uh, Martin Luther King or Mahatma Gandhi, because I think that was um, one of Gandhi's um, contributions to the world of politics, is, is how to bring together the mode of being in the world as a spiritual person as a moral person and also engage in, 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 in politics uh, and to move towards political change. Um, so that's, I mean, again, it's, it's something I feel, um, and I feel slightly reluctant discussing this now because I feel there is, there is a lot of energy today amongst young people, um, young people coming together and especially thinking about the environment uh, again, a subject that the encyclical engages with and is uppermost in, on, on all our minds at this point. Um, I feel that a lot of um, young people that I meet today in, in, in different countries, different contexts, are especially engaged with this subject and see this as a, as a, as a key to unlocking a whole lot of other um, dilemmas and, 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 and quandaries um, that the whole the sort of preservation of the, of the earth, the planet that we, of the natural world. And that political energy, how to harness that into a, into a larger movement? I mean, these are questions obviously the future will answer, but already I think um, even before the pandemic, um, I think there's some, some, some you know, unique opportunity has been opened up for the kind of popular movements that uh, Pope Francis talks about in the encyclical. You use the expression political love, which I don't uh, remember reading or hearing anywhere else. And uh, those two words usually don't go together in, in, in our everyday discourse. And that the, he, he refers to the, the, the poetry of these social movements. Actually, on that point, Paul, uh, uh, I, I have here the passage that Pankaj was referring to. It's really quite striking, the passage from Fratelli Tutti, where he's, uh, he says, writes that uh, there seems to be no place in standard economic accounts for popular movements that unite the unemployed, temporary and informal workers, and many others who do, do not easily find a place in existing structures, yet those movements manage various forms of popular economy and community production. Uh, and uh, he goes on, Paul, just as you were saying, uh, this must uh, happen in a way that will not betray their distinctive way of acting as sowers of change, promoters of a process involving millions of actions, great and small, creatively intertwined, referring to these social movements like words in a poem. And then he connects that to the renewal of democracy and to the struggle for dignity. This puts in mind one, one of your essays, Marilyn, go ahead, but it, I, your essay, Onward Christian Liberals, which is a staggering essay, you essentially remind us of how often these social movements in the history of the United States uh, uh, were rooted in liberal religion. Absolutely, so many of them. I, I've been struck by uh, this new uh, relief plan of Biden's, you know, 
uh, which is a, a, a great sweeping political act that would seem to have been impossible a year ago. You know, it really transforms the assumptions behind the relationship between government and the public, the people. Um, uh, it's very bold, it's, you know, and it's uh, enormously popular. And it's the sort of thing that makes you feel as though we're not so stuck. The concrete has not hardened, you know, in this, it's in other things. Um, that if somebody comes up with a good idea and it's generous and it, plan and it tends toward alleviating the miseries of feeling that you're not doing well by the people that are dependent on you, the children, for example, um, you know, with this sort of great flourish, he has made the demonstration that what the public will actually choose to follow, will embrace, is completely different from what we've been telling ourselves it was. And it's just like the handsomeness of the gesture. You know, the fact that politics is aesthetic, you know, um, that taking a, a beautiful stand is something that can transform an environment. Um, I, you know, obviously I'm completely delighted, but um, I think that's something to be taken into account. We are not so stuck. It does not have to be so endlessly, minorly incremental as we might otherwise assume. President Biden's language beginning with the campaign was build back better. And Francis in the encyclical essentially says, well, we can't just build back better. We have to build back different. And what you're suggesting, Marilyn, is that um, the, the plan that was just passed this morning isn't just a difference of degree, that there's a difference of kind there that um, it can be considered build back different uh, and, and gives us hope in that respect. Is that right? It certainly gives me hope which I cherish, not so much but around. <laughs> what about the idea that um, Francis is invoking an idea of the common good, he's rooting it in um, biblical religion, rooting it specifically in the parable of the Good Samaritan, but um, the, the let's say the, hist the history of uh, leaders of Western civilizational institutions um, identifying the common good and then um, making a program uh, to bring it about for everybody. That's, um, that's a, a vex history. Uh, the history of colonialism was the history of the, the British undertaking various projects in India and elsewhere and saying that the, the common good depended on it. Um, is, it is there an element of presumption in the, in the, the scale at what he's proposing? And, and how, how can we think uh, critically about that? Well, I think, I mean, some, so, sorry, me. yes. um, <laughs> I think something that um, Paul Francis says, um, and I, 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 sh I should quote him actually, um, where he says, what is needed is a model of social, political, and economic participation. And I think, I think it's really important, actually, these, this, this particular choice of phrase, participation, that can include popular movements, and invigorate local, national, and international governing structures with the torrent of moral energy that springs from including the excluded in the building of a common destiny. So I think in a way, uh, he is very much stepping away from the model of uh, the governing structure or the charismatic leader who announces you know, very ambitious, very uh, significant plan but at the same time, doesn't actually also create a mass movement to go with it. And this is you know, really now the model of politics everywhere where uh, we are still looking up to, uh, we still expect certain elites uh, with a degree of expertise to take certain decisions, but we actually haven't really thought about you know, how, uh, and, and this is one of the problems with many political parties, uh, Michael Sendel has written about it uh, with many parties, especially on the left, um, uh, whether it's the Democrat, Democrats in, in, in America or Labour Party or social democratic parties in, 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 in Europe, they've all become far too technocratic and at the same time far too removed from ordinary people. 
So including the excluded in the building of a common destiny, uh, that is not really being part of the program. And building solidarity, certainly not um, being part of their part of their program. So I think in, in, in that sense, uh, Pope Francis is pointing at something different, which is that politics not conceived as a process towards a particular goal or a particular aim, but politics as an end in itself, as a, as a mode of solidarity, as a mode of community, uh, as a mode of participation, uh, as a mode of including the excluded. And that is something I feel like certainly no politician uh, right now is proposing, uh, which is building uh, a, a movement that brings all these excluded people in and lessens thereby uh, the feeling of resentment, of exclusion, uh, and indeed humiliation that they felt for a, for a long time. Um, so admirable as, 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 as Joe Biden's plan may be, but if it's not accompanied by that effort, then it may remain and of course be contested by the, the, um, the, the sort of far right uh, opposition and will be turned into something else. But uh, of course, you know, this is something they do all the time, but um, I feel that it, it needs to be backed by a, uh, uh, this, this, this kind of moral energy that um, Pope Francis is speaking of here. Believe, believe me, I'm, I'm with the program. I really uh, want it to happen. I'm just feeling the tensions. You know, Marilyn, you've written beautifully about what it means to love one's country and how love for a particular country and its traditions is what um, forms a community. Michael, you've devoted you know, decades to uh, parsing the way competing ideas of justice uh, um, rub up against each other in public life. If there were a consensus about what the common good is, we would be much further along than we are. So um, before we go to questions, would each of you be able to speak to these tensions that I'm identifying? And maybe I'm off base, but uh, it's just something I felt very clearly reading the, reading the cyclical. Caroline, go ahead. Well, I, I feel as though politics, if it's functional at all, is creating norms creating expectations and that at least in this country it's possible for these things to change quite abruptly as we go from you know the theory behind reaganism to the theory behind you know bidenism apparently um i am a an absolute pragmatist for politics is concerned i if someone is hungry i want them fed if they're naked i want them clothed you know um and i think establishing that is what one does in a society that that very practical uh, commitment to the well-being of the people who by whatever definition or accident or whatever share as it were community with you um i think that if we are in the habit of assuming that um what is called neoliberalism is really the prevailing force that will reassert itself and transform things that are lovely into things that are not and so on if we assume that, and if we assume that the, there's no latitude at all in public thinking about what might be desired, uh, we're stuck. And in a way that uh, undervalues uh, democracy, frankly, because I do think that a, a very large percentage of people could be very easily persuaded to do a lot better than we've been doing. So we're saying <laughs> pragmatist, so it's just in the sense, if we could have a government that put a greater emphasis on feeding the hung hungry and um, sheltering the homeless, we would be uh, um, dramatically uh, on, on the way to the um, vision of fraternity that Pope Francis sets out. It's, it's be, pragmatic in that sense? Yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, I mean, it's natural. I really feel that it is to feed the hungry. It is unnatural to close your hand when you see need among people that you in any way identify with, which basically is their humanity, you know. Um, I don't, uh, I don't, we, we have, as, as uh, has been said, we've created this artificial idea of success. We don't really believe that we have a true functioning elite. We feel, I think most of us, that we were better at identifying an elite a generation or two ago than we are now. 
we, you know, the, a lot of the unhealthiness of the, you know, fascination with elitism is that we feel that it's content, it's, it's arbitrary. Um, we should banish these artificial things. We have, we have to, you know, I mean, I went to public school until I went to college and then I went to public university for my graduate degree. They were excellent. I went to an Ivy League school in between. It was excellent. But I have no doubt that I could have been perfectly well educated staying in, in public universities. Why is it that we devalue the word public? We do now. That's not always true, has not always been true in this country. We devalue them rhetorically and then we devalue them by, by cheating on their budgets and so on, you know? Um, we create these artificial distinctions that are not real distinctions and they do enormous human harm as you have said. If, if I could add, add to that, Paul, uh, Pope Francis in speaking about the common good in writing about the common good seems alive to the challenge of holding two ideas uh, at once, reconciling two ideas. First, he, uh, the, the common good involves a shared way of life under conditions of pluralism. And yet it can't merely be a consensus because Pope Francis also believes, and I think rightly, that the common good also aspires to truth. But how is it possible to hold together pluralism on the one hand and an aspiration to truth on the other? I, I was always struck by uh, a passage from Isaiah Berlin writing about liberty when he said, a wise man once said, he was quoting Schumpeter actually, wise man once said that to believe in the relative validity of one's convictions and yet to stand for them unflinchingly is what distinguishes a civilized man from a barbarian. This is Isaiah Berlin. And this always seemed to me a, a wrongheaded way of thinking about <laughs> values and about pluralism and the common good. Uh, because I, I always wondered when I read that, well, if one's values are merely relative, why stand for them unflinchingly? Why? Why, why do that? What's the warrant for doing that? And then I, I was long having puzzled about that. In Fratelli Tutti, Pope Francis writes, talking about this problem, the solution is not relativism. Under the guise of tolerance, Relativism ultimately leaves the interpretation of moral values to those in power to be defined as they see fit. So relativism is not the way to contend with pluralism. The way to contend with pluralism in seeking the common good is to create a common life, a shared life that enables deliberation, but a deliberation it has to aim at something other than mere consensus. It has to aim at something true. And so this is, a, I think, a, a brave and bold way of trying to grapple with this question of pluralism and truth. And then I find it very compelling. But it's, it's against the grain in many ways. It goes against the grain of of um, much of our thinking about how to contend with pluralism. What does tolerance really mean? How can we aspire to the common good? It's, it's very hard headed too. Well, let's not fret too much about the relative quality of our values because the, um, the, um, the powers that be will, will move in and claim that space and define uh, good and evil, right and wrong, uh, um, truth and falsehood the, the way they see fit, uh, right. not, they will not themselves fret over um, the rel relative nature of values. They'll just go in and do it. And, and we've seen this in, in waves in recent times where 
the the when we create a vacuum, a moral vacuum in public life by con, by assigning markets the role of adjudicating competing claims and demands, we we do create that moral void in the name of a kind of neutrality or toleration. But in fact, that moral void is invariably filled filled by narrow, intolerant moralisms, typically in the form of various fundamentalisms or in the form of strident nationalism, an attempt to fill uh, an empty public space, a space empty of larger public meaning with sources of meaning that are deeply destructive. And then what we do to wind things back to the beginning is that um, that arrangement is regarded as a kind of face, the new yeah. neoliberal market face. Yeah. I'd like to go to questions now from the audience, but beginning with a question from Bishop Tai, uh, the undersecretary of the Pontifical Council for Culture, who's one of our co-sponsors and a regular dialogue partner of, of mine during some long afternoon conversations in Rome, for which thanks very much, Bishop Tai. It's really glad to have you along. Um, uh, can you respond uh, with a question uh, to this conversation? Yeah, just first, I'd like to just thank the three panelists for what were, I found very hopeful interventions. I love the idea Marilyn said that, you know, the concrete is not set. There is room. One thing that strikes me is that Pope Francis is very strong on this idea. We dialogue, the importance of dialogue in order to search together for truth, a truth that we may establish with consensus, but a truth that is not made by consensus, the truth that has a claim on us that is prior to us. And he has this very important, I think, belief that the dialogue has to be truly inclusive if we're going to have hope of finding that truth. We need the perspectives of everybody, not just those who agree with us, but also those from different backgrounds and different disciplines. There's been a lot of mention about universe education, I think, in the last number of years has become a very utilitarian. We acquire the skills to make it in a fairly brutal world and to credential ourselves to be in the right uh, chain. Can universities reclaim that sense of being places that enable people to th think together, to reflect together, to find a vision, a narrative, a dream in life that makes life worthwhile, to propose that people search for a truth or is the culture so pluralistically I mean, it should be pluralistic, but is it so relativistic that universities would almost be afraid to open up these bigger questions? Well, uh, I, I don't. Uh, I, I have a thought about that. I think it's important that they try, but I think uh, it's a struggle not only because of moral relativism, Bishop Tai, but also because we have cast higher education in the role of uh, in the role of actually becoming sorting machines for a, a highly credentialist society. And the sorting function, the credentializing function, the networking function, the instrumentalization of universities threatens to crowd out and to corrupt the intrinsic goods that higher education should serve, including inviting students to ref or reflect critically on their purposes, on what's worth caring about and why, and, um, and the intrinsic goods of teaching and learning. So in order to make space for that, I think we have to, um, uh, we have to emphasize less the sorting and the credentializing and the networking associated with uh, universities and higher education and uh, reconnect the curricula, but also the practice of higher education to the intrinsic goods that education ideally serves. Thank you. I think actually that there are orthodoxies that become incredibly potent in universities um, and that you know, I mean, I don't know a better system for doing what they do than peer review. Nevertheless, peer review can also be something that conventionalizes thinking 
because people don't accept or, or people are afraid they won't accept uh, views that depart from the ones that are orthodox. And I find that, for example, I know I complain about this all the time, but the anthropologies that prevail in university settings, I think, are A, terrible in themselves, and B, no gift to kids that come there to have themselves shaped and their ex expectations set for them and so on. Um, they, a student said to me once, I feel as though I'm, I will only live, work, and die. And I think that that, you know, this idea of little petty profit motives being, you know, somehow entrenched in our humanity and so on, it's, it's very prevalent and I think just utterly impoverishing. Gosh. Oh, um, I feel that my own experience of universities is really far too limited um, for me to say anything meaningful about this. I mean, I think um, in, uh, in India, where I do know the universities, they are really essentially, or have been for a very long time, uh, degree granting institutions. Uh, they're meant to credential people for this or that. Um, and uh, I think, you know, many of the, the, the problems that uh, exist in uh, or the debates or the philosophical debates that come up in the United States and Britain around the role of universities and their role in creating certain discourses or entrenching certain orthodoxies uh, does not even happen here because there's you know such such a such an incredibly hectic race to get ahead to get a degree to get a job uh, that many of these issues um, simply simply don't come up at all. What you say, Pankaj reminds me of some, something that Marilyn has written at, at several points, which is and one, of, one of Marilyn's themes is just how, how rich our society is in, in so many ways and in none richer than in the diversity and abundance of our higher education and, the, the, and our blindness to our own riches and our willingness to um, straighten the gate of higher education, which is, um, is impossibly rich and, and reduce it to a credentializing enterprise is, a, is, is one of the nuttiest things that's going on in, in this country, at least in our time, I think. Um, is that a fair summary, Marilyn? Very fair. Absolutely. I can't believe it. You know, I've traveled around to all kinds of colleges and universities just in the course of my life. And they are, they're little oases of wonderful things. You know, they're scattered all across the country. The little ones are wonderful in their way and the big ones are wonderful in their way. And they can be religious or secular or private or public, but they're all treasures that would be extraordinary institutions anywhere in the world. And we, we act as if there are only eight or 10 of them that are actually worth applying for. It's ridiculous. It's such a waste. You can't even believe it. The first question from the audience is from uh, Sybil Frisch Opperman, and she asks, how do you see the role of non-theistic religions and what role can they play in realizing the vision of Fratelli Tutti? Pankaj, you want to take that one? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, it's, it's a hugely important question because obviously um, the institution of the Pope and the tradition of the encyclical, um, they're all you know, part of a specific religious tradition to which most people uh, are, well, to, mo to which most people uh, are not invited or they don't feel they're a part of it, um, or they're not even aware of it. Um, but at the same time, I think I do sense in this encyclical a very strong attempt to reach out to people who are not Catholics or not even Christians uh, for that matter. But to arrive again, you know, going back to the question of the common good um, and the idea of, you know, some kind of a working consensus that can we do that in our irrevocably pluralist societies uh, where 
truth or shared culture, these are not givens anymore, or shared beliefs, um, these are not givens anymore. Uh, what are the modes in which people can, 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 can come together? Uh, and I feel like this is something that the encyclical is very much engaged with and, and, and trying to come up with a solution to that uh, as to what, how do we address people who are uh, not believers in, in, in the Christian sense. Um, and again, I mean, I feel like his answer, which is a very interesting one uh, about participation, about uh, movements and, 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 and um, releasing, unleashing moral energy, uh, thinking of uh, political activity or activism in general as a kind of process. I think these are, I mean, these are very fruitful, very fruitful notions, which would appeal to, again, you know, people who are not uh, Catholics or Christians. In a way that connects with the next question, when you mentioned social movements, uh, this question is from Anne Delory. And she says, the model of shared power that's lifted up in Fratelli Tutti is very, quote, feminine. And yet there's very little reference to female persons, experiences, or leadership. Women continue to be the backbone of political and social movements. How can we make sense of this? Marilyn or Michael? Well, you know, the world has a lot of bad old habits. <laughs> and one of them is to forget the presence of certain people, you know. Um, you know, the Stacey Abrams of the world that just are not particularly, you know, only, only rarely recognized. Um, I, um, you know, I, I appreciate it when the importance of women is acknowledged. I'm not shocked when it is not. A lot of progress has been made. There's a question from Frederick Glacier. I've repeatedly read the claim that early Christianity practiced, quote, communism, though I always thought such conceptions were anachronistic and polemical. And there in paragraphs 19, 119 and 120 of Fratelli Tutti, Pope Francis presents the idea of a common destination of created goods as an astonishingly expansive spiritual global economic model. What are the patristic or historical sources of this? How can we think about this idea of the common destination of created goods? Are there particular thinkers or books that um, the three of you might um, uh, point the listener toward? Common destination of created goods. When I read that, I was struck by how created is now in there uh, and it connects things to our common home. I'm not sure that even Francis himself you know, would have put it that way 10 years ago. This is just a guess, but the emphasis on created goods, Paul, I agree is intriguing. And it could be that that gesture toward, gestures toward the sense in which we can't really distinguish as labor market economic theories of moral desert require, can't really distinguish the particular contributions that this or that person makes to a product. Because there is one way of thinking uh, that says, if only we could, then we would know who contributed what and who contributed how much, and therefore who should be rewarded, reward in proportion to contribution in production. But if goods, if, we, if, if it turns out that we can't really differentiate or parse um, individual contributions to the productive process, and I think there's reason to doubt that we can, then there wouldn't be a presumption that rewards should simply track how much you put in, what role you as an individual played in producing this product. And so perhaps I'm, I'm reading into this um, 
uh, a moral and political economy that Pope Francis didn't have in mind, but that would be one way of making sense of um, leaving open the question, how should good, the goods be distributed, rather than assuming there was a default presumed answer to that question, if only we could parse who, which individual was responsible for, um, and in what proportion for the production of this or that good. You think that's a reach, Pankaj, Maryland? Do you think that's a reach or do you think there's something in that, Paul? I had a quick follow-up question, but yeah. just how does that square with Pope Francis at one point in the encyclical says, um, uh, to give to each his own, the, the common, the, the classic definition of justice, which kind of jumped out at me because it yeah. seemed to be so much in with what, um, with the vision of things that you just spelled out. He was yeah. quoting another document, but if, so can we still think of justice as to give to each his own when the question of what our own is, is so contested? Well, maybe not. Maybe he's calling into question that. Which paragraph is that, Paul? You remember? 171. Um, I didn't need to uh, crowd the other you know, Pankaj in Maryland. That, it just occurred to me because I wondered that reading the document myself. Yeah, it, it is. Well, this, this uh, would fit with the earlier reading. I would insist, 171, that to give to each his own means that no human individual or group consider itself absolute, entitled to bypass the dignity and the rights of others, even, uh, yeah, it, de it depends what, whether giving to each his own means, giving to each in proportion to his somehow individuated contribution to production, which I'm guessing Pope Francis is skeptical about. And maybe Bishop Tai has a view of Meanwhile, Marilyn and Pankaj, you both had things you were going to say before I jumped in there, I think. I was just going to say rather uselessly that the only economist I'm aware of that actually takes a thoroughgoing critical approach to the question of the distribution of value is say, the uh, 19th century American Henry George, Progress mm. of Poverty. He's very interesting. And he, think, he simply thinks differently than other economists, which makes it just, he doesn't come out of the English uh, tradition the way everybody else seems to do. Right. There's a question from Alexandra O'Brien. Her question, which I'll um, uh, paraphrase a bit, how, how can we recognize the fact that so many Catholics have issue with Francis's liberal views on tolerance uh, for those who are different she includes LGBTQ people and immigrants, and while they embrace what's called Trumpism, I guess more broadly, um, what does it imply when the notion of um, the common good and uh, human fraternity that's espoused by Pope Francis seems not to um, even be resonant within large parts of the Catholic community? Well, that's almost a kind of recommendation really for him um, that those ideas are uh, contested, that there are strong, there is a strong opposition. I, I, I think, I, I mean, personally, as a non-Catholic or as a non-Christian, I would be extremely wary of any kind of uh, strong consensus around a figure like, uh, figure like the Pope. Um, I think the idea that um, many of these things still have to be sorted out, that they're still being discussed, they're being debated, and there is a conversation going on, um, is much, much more reassuring than the notion that there is uh, absolute unanimity around the views of uh, Pope Francis, and, 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 and especially uh, the, the views that he's advanced in, uh, in the last uh, eight years. That's really wise and opens things up for me. If, if he were really a, a, a critic of the established order on the level that we're, um, uh, we're recognizing here, it, it would be, uh, it wouldn't fit that he would have so many people united behind him. He's, he's, he's got to have critics himself if he's really um, 
saying things that are truly provocative. And as I, I mean, as I said in the beginning, also that um, I, I I don't think he's only really addressing um, the Catholic community. Um, he's very much a global figure, a world figure, uh, a, a personality whose visits, whose ideas, whose travels are closely monitored, followed across the world. And I think, again, most importantly, um, he represents, well, certainly in the Catholic community, but also experiences of particular parts of the world um, that have not really been heard from, um, that have, or at least not properly heard from. So that is also something we have to keep in mind that we can't really just confine him. Uh, we can't just keep thinking of him as someone engaged in a dialogue or a debate with people opposed to him or uh, people who don't agree with him within the Catholic community. There are larger audiences that he's both addressing, larger audiences that he's also representing. Um, and that is, I think, something that should be that should be kept in mind when we bring up this other aspect of uh, or the more kind of controversial or contentious aspects of his uh, teachings. Question from Henry Slavens. If seeing people as images of God and fellow brothers and sisters is essential, do you think there's work to be done in acknowledging the ways that black Americans have been dehumanized? Do we need to take a serious look at slavery before considering other issues surrounding brotherhood and sisterhood? This goes back to my question about, was, was there ever a time in which human fraternity um, was more fully realized than at present? History seems to suggest otherwise. Everything needs to be looked at, you know? It's, I mean, taking simply the question of um, black Americans, uh, the circumstances of their existence within the United States has had so many, you know, for them, so many, what's the word I want? <laughs> but in any case, uh, their lives are modified in a thousand different ways that are not obvious as racial issues. And, you know, that there's always more thinking to be done. Um, there's always more awakening to be done. Um, so, you know, I mean, the thing, I don't think that you can isolate the problems of, of Black life in America without looking at it at a very broad scale, which of course takes in all sorts of other issues at the same time. And that brings to mind for me some feature of this encyclical and possibly I think of Francis's other encyclicals as well. You know, the, the old adage was Rome has spoken, the matter is closed, but the um, temper of this document very much, it's a, it's a point of departure or beginning. It's an unrealized document. It's meant to um, point us in a direction that you know, others are gonna have to carry out. And in that sense, it's, it's a, um, uh, Pope and church as um, serving, serving rather than declaring and dictating and, um, and itself gives hope. Is that the way the three of you, um, none, of, none of you are Catholic, is that your impression of the text? Certainly, you know, it, it seems, I mean, he, he seems to be uh, open to the idea that our sense of what is true and necessary will be, uh, you know, progressively developed that, uh, you know, even, you know, no doubt he is also renouncing earlier opinions of his when he was a young man and so on. Um, and he, he has come abreast of thinking that would have uh, been very startling to people, you know, 40 or 50 years ago. Um, and I think that that's what we need to do. And that's a very good model for our trying to become worthier of, of our life in the world. One striking feature of the encyclical, Paul, along the lines that you suggest is that what Pope Francis writes here is not uncontroversial by any means. It involves competing conceptions 
of the economy, of markets, of globalization, of work, of the common good, of the meaning of social friendship. People of good faith can disagree, and yet there is, uh, it is a document that is written to invite reflection on the question of solidarity and social friendship from people who may or may not share the theological background assumptions upon which Pope Francis draws. And that's, that's a great achievement. It's also a contribution, uh, a, a truly impressive contribution, I think, to prompting global public discourse about the most fundamental questions, uh, but a prompt, an invitation that is open to those who may share many of the actual convictions about the common good, but arrive at them from various theological uh, frameworks and perspectives. And that's, that's beautifully put. Um, and I, yeah. I don't think I can add more to it, but yes, it's. I, I, I was reminded while reading the encyclical of, of um, Gandhi's notion of um, truth in action, you know, what he calls Satyagraha, um, where he says, you know, he is, um, for him, God is truth, but since he hasn't found God yet, um, relative truth in the meantime will be my beacon. Uh, another version of the Asai Berlin quote uh, Michael Samuel had. Um, and that relative truth is best found in dialogue and debate and action. Um, and this is in, in many ways, you know, this is what the encyclical is urging us to is um, this notion of engaging in this, it's this, this, this notion of participation and engagement. Um, and, you know, something that people, as Michael said, do not share the assumptions, um, religious or theological, um, that he's working with, can still um, engage with and find deeply meaningful. I like to think that this has been the kind of uh, participation, just three of us from different backgrounds, um, in different places, uh, coming together to um, speak about the encyclical um, together in our different ways. It certainly felt that way. I want to thank each of you so much for taking the time to take part and obviously for um, uh, your reading of the encyclical and all the uh, prep that you brought to it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to mention a couple of um, forthcoming events before uh, we sign off. Next Monday, March 15th at noon, we're going to host a conversation about the Pope's trip to Iraq and its political and religious significance with Father Antonio Spadaro. He's the editor-in-chief of La Cipotà Cattolica and accompanied Pope Francis to Iraq. And with R Ricardo Cristiano, the Italian journalist and Vatican expert. Sean Casey, the moderator, uh, is the director of the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace and World Affairs. And then next Thursday at 1230 Eastern time, as is the, the Monday event, our friends at the Initiative for Catholic Social Thought and Public Life be holding an online dialogue on the Francis Factor at eight years, eight years since Francis' election. Global impacts, U.S. challenges. And the participants there will include Cardinal Sean O'Malley, Cardinal Peter Turkson, Cindy Wooden from the Catholic News Service, and Michelle Gonzalez Maldonado from the University of Scranton. There will, you can RSV for both events. There are links in the chat. And this event uh, will be posted on the Berkeley Center's website co coming up. Uh, so if you want to review the event or share the link uh, uh, with friends who couldn't take part today. Once again, thank you so much, Pankaj. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, President DeJoya. Thank you, Bishop Tai. And thanks to our co-sponsors at the Office of the President, the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace and World Affairs, the Initiative for Catholic Social Thought and Public Life, the Pontifical Council for Culture, and La Civita Cattolica. Uh, thank you very much. I'm, uh, it was such a privilege to take part in the event and speak with all of you. Uh, have a great afternoon. <laughs>